Welcome to lab one. In this uh, lab is going to be about getting started in uh, the C programming language and getting you used to the procedure for writing C programs, how to compile them, how to run them. And then we go on to more complex tasks uh, after this uh, after this lab. So the first thing to do is to read the web page. So go to the course website and go to the lab one uh, page, which is under the labs uh, tab. And as you can see, there are many sections here that lay out all the different tasks and some uh, additional information uh, for you to read. So when you click on the introduction, you can see that there usually is some text you should read, and then there is a section, there's sometimes a section that looks like this, which has some important information. And you should always follow these instructions carefully and don't move on until you've completed them, because otherwise later on uh, you might get stuck. And then you'll wonder why, and you should have gone back and followed these instructions. So you'll make your life very easy if you can read these instructions carefully for each task especially and also whenever I highlight something that's important you should pay attention to it. So I'm going to assume that you've done lab zero, that you've done task one and task two in lab zero and if uh, and that you have looked and seen that you've uh, completed them successfully. If you haven't then stop this video and go back and do lab zero. Set up your code repository uh, make sure that you can clone it so that you can uh, you know how to do a git clone and then the repository address and make sure that you can change your directory into that repository if you can't if you haven't done that yet then stop now go and do that first okay so once you've done that let's go to the setup section what we're going to do is set up the directory in which we're going to solve all of the tasks in lab one. And there are just uh, a few steps to do that. You do make directory, you add the directory to your Git repository, you change your directory there, and you make sure that you're in the right directory. So I'm just going to do that on this uh, terminal window here. I'm going to interact with the shell, make a directory. I'm going to git add one which is a directory name, cd1, and then I'm going to check. There's nothing in this directory. I'm going to check that I'm in the directory that ends in 1. Okay. So if you've completed your setup, then you're ready to start task 1 in lab 1. So let's go ahead and do that. Uh, go to your web page and open up task 1, which is about something called compiling, and I'll tell you what that means. And we're going to write our very first program, which is always traditionally a, something called a Hello World program. So we just print out Hello World, and that's our task. So when you open this task, there will be an introduction usually. In every task, there will be an intro, especially for the earlier labs. Uh, later on, we might uh, skip with the pleasantries because you'll know more, and there will be less to introduce. Uh, if you remember, uh, there are important things for you to read, which are in these boxes, so please read them. The most important thing for you to pay attention to in every task is this requirement section. The requirements are very, very important. So let me, they're so important, I'm going to repeat it. The requirements are the main thing that you have to do in this task. So you have to read it, you have to understand it. You have to read it multiple times. In this case, the requirement is very simple. We're going to write a program. The program has to have this name, c1.c. The .c is an extension, which is a convention we use uh, to give a name that sort of tells you what type of file it is. And a .c file is usually contains a C program. It's just a text file, but it contains a C program. Um, and we want this program to print out hello world to the standard output. Now it's very important to read this carefully. Sometimes 
even one character might be very important uh, and might cause your task the auto grader to fail on your submission and you should look back and see uh, in some cases you have to pay very close attention to even sort of one character all right so we actually also have uh, a guide since it's the first task in our uh, lab that's introducing you to the C programming language it shows you a C program that prints uh, a string so notice that the requirement says you need to print a string so this is showing you how to print a string in fact it's printing hello world um, so let's uh, just we could just copy paste this into a file but I'm going to type it out in an editor here uh, so on this terminal window I'm going to load up a text editor I'm going to use nano for now um, it's not my preferred editor but uh, I'm uh, using it because it's a it's a good introductory editor to use uh, in later uh, labs I might uh, not be using such a basic editor so we load up this uh, editor and it's uh, editing this file t1.c and every um, C program has to start with a main function and the first thing to realize is that it is um, uh, a int is short for integer is something that this function is going to return. So I'm writing a function and the function is called main. It takes no arguments and when it takes no arguments in C the convention is to uh, write down a type and the type is called void. Uh, the void type is basically empty and then I open braces. So if you're used to Python you're not used to uh, braces but in C you need braces for every scope. So when I want something, when I want to define a function, I want to say, here are all the statements in this function. I start off by putting an open brace. And then I type in printf, because that's a function that guy can use. So printf is just like any, uh, just a function, just like we're defining main as a function right here. So I'm printf, hello, hello world. And now I want to uh, print a new line so I want to actually have hello world on a line by itself so I put in this backslash n which is an escape character that stands for a new line um, so it prints it nice uh, and uh, in, in one line and doesn't just sort of leave the line hanging and then I finish this function by returning something and uh, there's a hint as to what I should return so I wrote down the fact that main returns an integer. Uh, so I want to return an integer. So what should I return? Well, I'm going to return zero because the shell is what's going to be calling my program. And uh, when it calls this program, a shell program, when it gets a zero, thinks that, oh, this program succeeded. So uh, when I return zero to the shell, Shell is happy and thinks that the program succeeded. If I return a one, Shell thinks the program didn't work. Uh, it's just a hint to the Shell whether this program works or not. The other very important thing about C, as you'll notice, that's different from Python is that you need a semicolon. Uh, and that semicolon is the end, marks the end of every statement. And now we need to say, well, we're done declaring this function, so I put a close brace. And that's um, that's my function. I'm going to save it. In nano, I press Control X and I say, yes, I want to save it. And it asks me for a file name, which is t1.c. That's the default. That's good. I just press enter. Okay. When I do cat t1.c, I can see the program I just printed. Now, if I wanted to do this in Python, right, I could py type in Python Python interpreter, it gives me a prompt. And now what I would do is if I wanted to print hello world, I would just say print hello world. And I don't need to put a backslash and because by default it does that for me. So if I put print hello world backslash and it does know about it, it just prints an extra new line, right? Um, so notice that I did not have to do anything 
other than have Python read my source code and it would execute it. So Python is what we call an interpreted language. So it reads every line of the source code that I've written and then executes it. That's at least the basic way of looking at it. Uh, in C, there is no such thing as a C interpreter. So when I do cat t1.c, this is my C program, but uh, there is no C interpreter. Instead, what we have is a C compiler. The C compiler is called CC. And CC takes t1.c and then converts it into machine code, a binary file, uh, which is not text. Uh, and it is that binary file that we can execute uh, and ask the operating system to execute it for us. But there was a problem. So we saw that the compiler is not very happy with this program. And it says, warning, there's an implicit declaration of function printf. So it says, I don't know about printf. But we just said that printf is a way that C prints strings. Uh, there's a helpful note here. It says, include standard i.h, or provide a declaration of printf. So it turns out printf is actually not a part of the, the core C language. In fact, it's just a function. And the function sits in a library. A library is just a place where there are lots of helpful functions defined. And for each such uh, library function, there is a header file. In this case, it's standard io.h, or stdio.h for short. And if we tell the C compiler that we want to use the printf from this standard library, we do that by telling the compiler that um, we want to include standard io.h. And this is um, telling the compiler that I have uh, the printf definition is inside this declaration, standard io.h. And um, the C compiler knows where to find this. It's installed when you install the C compiler. And it looks up that uh, declaration and it says, oh yeah, it does take a string. Uh, so it matches the fact that you're calling printf with a string and uh, matches that up with the def declaration of printf. And then it goes ahead, goes ahead and generates a code uh, for it. So I'm going to save this file. And now when I do t1.c, I get this first line, which is to include standard i.h. So now let's try and uh, do cct1.c. So it's no error messages came up. If I do ls, you can see that it created a new file. It's called a.out. And if I run a.out, it prints hello world. Um, so that's that's a kind of basic step for compiling a C program into a binary. Um, if I cat this a dot out, you can see it's just a bunch of junk. Um, and because it's a binary file, uh, and one way to look at it is to hex dump it. Um, and you can see it's just a bunch of uh, binary instructions for the computer to execute. A way to create a binary that is uh, a more helpful name is to say cc minus o hello t1.c. And now I can execute hello, and it prints hello world. Let's move on to task two. Task two is it's uh, there to emphasize the fact that C has these types, like we saw before, that there was a function called main, and it returned an integer. And we actually had to type that in, uh, the definition uh, of the function. So everything, not just functions, every single thing in C has a type. So variables have a type, functions have a type. And so C is often called a strongly typed language. Let's uh, load up a, another language, Python in this case. And let's define a function. So we do 
define a function called foo, takes two arguments, a and b, and it returns uh, a times b times c. Okay. So this is a function I just defined. Notice that um, Python doesn't say that it has to return an integer. It doesn't say anything about what the types of a and b are. Uh, so I can type in foo 2 comma 3, and it will return 18, right? 2 times 3 times 3. Uh, if I type in foo 2 comma sausage, it's going to say you cannot multiply uh, something which is a non-integer with a string. So it does know about types but the language doesn't force you to define those types when you define the function. So C is different. Um, uh, we will define uh, a function in C and look at the variable types. But first, before I leave this example, try to do this without the final times C and do exactly what I did and see what you get. And think about that uh, if you get a chance. Um, okay, so let's uh, now we are going on to task two. Um, so let's look at the definition of task two. Um, let's go down here. Uh, so it tells you there's a lot of information in task two uh, about all the different types that exist in C. These are the integer and just a simple integer and floating point types. There are other types we can define, um, but we'll look at those later. So the main, I want you to read through the requirements. Uh, so actually, first read through all of the information that uh, tells you what types are and how C sort of interprets this notion of types. Um, I'm going to move to the requirements, which is to write a C program called T2, and it's going to output the storage size in bits of each type from this table above. So it has to produce the output, the size of character, unsigned character, integer, unsigned integer, long, unsigned long, so all a float, double, long, double. So these are nine types. You need to print out the storage size. Uh, and um, the output, for example, is something like that, which is the storage uh, size for each of those nine uh, basic types, integer and floating point types. A floating point number is just like a, a real number, something uh, which, you, uh, which is between uh, uh, any integer value, right? So 3.1.4. 3.14159 would be an example of a floating point value. Um, so C provides a size of operator that tells you the storage size of any type in bytes. So it's important. And we can do that by using a printf, and it prints out the size of an integer. So you just need to extend this. So this already all solves the output for integer. If you notice, not quite. So you have to notice uh, one more detail in the requirements. Uh, so this is printing out the storage size in bytes. Right? Um, so we want uh, to print it out in bits. So that's uh, that's what you have to figure out. So if you read the rest of the description, you'll find it pretty easy to figure that out. Um, so when you um, if you type in t2.c, so remember, you need to include standard io.h. You have a main function, uh, and yeah, saying it does not take any arguments. Printf, and then percent %lu. So what does this percent %lu mean? Well, c has types, right? So every type. Um, will have different uh, format requirements. So if you're typing out a string, printf needs to know that. So if you're typing out a, if you're printing out a floating point number, printf needs to know that. So this is a way of telling printf. It's like a code that tells printf that I'm going to give you something which is an unsigned int, so a integer that cannot be negative, um, and I'm giving it this operator size of, and I'm asking it to 
find me the size of int in bytes and then I return zero and finish. So this is my uh, program and I can output a binary called teach you and when I run it it says four. So what does that mean? It means that in this computer uh, the size of an integer is four bytes. Okay. Um, so you can also ask size of to return you uh, the size of other types that C knows about. And that's what this uh, task is all about. So let's move on to task three. Task three is going to be uh, about taking some input from the user. So the opposite of printf, which is printf was printing out a variable. Now we want to read in a value uh, into a variable uh, based on maybe prompting the user to give us a variable, the value of a variable. So there is a function um, which is called scanf. Scanf is a function that is uh, the opposite of printf. In that printf prints a variable, scanf will read the value of uh, uh, read a value and then put it inside a variable for you. Uh, and uh, so the first thing we want to look at is why we have this special symbol here, this ampersand, which is in front of the variable name. So before we used to just give the variable name, but now we have to give an ampersand uh, in front of i, and i was defined here. So what well, we just want to know what's going on. Uh, it involves a very basic concept, which is the concept of a pointer. Um, and a pointer is something that is uh, an important concept that belongs, you need to understand pointers if you're going to program in C. Uh, and that's what this task is about, to give you an introduction to pointers. You'll be running into pointers a lot uh, over this course, and this is your first introduction to them. So we're going to start by doing some basic stuff that involves the use of a pointer. So pointers are extremely useful for all kinds of things and you can't do C programming without understanding pointers. So you really need to understand uh, this task uh, if you want to survive the rest of the course. Let's write a simple program. So it's not the solution to task 3 but it's just a demo. I'm going to call it t3demo.c and I'm going to stop using nano and uh, use a, a editor that I'm more comfortable with. So I'm using VI, you can use gedit, you can use sublime text by typing in SCBL or any other editor you wish. Um, I'm going to use this one because I'm comfortable using it. Uh, I don't recommend using VI unless you're familiar with it, uh, at least not uh, not until you get your comfortable uh, programming on Linux. Okay, so VI gives me line numbers, so it's easier as well to look at uh, to tell you which line I'm talking about. So the first thing I do is I just do hash include standard io.h because I know that I'm going to print out something using printf, and then I do the same thing as before. So this is not very different from earlier, and. Uh, the first thing I want to do is uh, I want to read in uh, a value uh, and I'm going to ask the user to type in a value and I want a long unsigned int i and I'm going to say that this is initialized to the value 0 but I really want to read it so I'm going to use a scanf and I'm going to say this is a long unsigned int and I want to read that from the standard input and I'm going to put the ampersand i so the ampersand says give me the address of i not the value of i and the main reason for this is that C is a uh, language that always passes the value of anything so if I pass just i it's going to pass it a value and I'll, I'll take out the ampersand in a, in a minute and I, you can see uh, so now I can print f uh, this value i. So now I want i because it's the actual contents of i. I don't want the address of i or the pointer to i. 
So this is i equals, uh, and then I return 0, and that's my program. So I can do cc t 3 democc and what I get is uh, it's just waiting. So it's waiting for some input. So if I type in 42 and I press enter, it says i equals 42, and notice that it did not print a new line here because I forgot to do that. Uh, so I can go back to the program, type in uh, backslash n, compile it again, and type in 42, and now it looks a little bit prettier, right? So now if I go back to t3demo.c, um, let's try and remove this ampersand and say ask nf for a long unsigned int, but I don't give it a pointer. So if I try to compile this, it says warning, you, I think something is wrong, you're expecting a type of long unsigned int pointer, but what you gave me is a long unsigned int, right? So um, what is a what is a pointer and why why does that mean that a scanf needs a pointer? So this thing is useless to scanf. It needs really something that points to a location where it can uh, read in this value. So what do I mean by point by? What's a pointer? So let's uh, look at that concept next. The best way to visualize what a pointer is is to look at uh, analogy. So let's look at the analogy of a, of a whole bunch of mailboxes. And maybe this one, the number 114 represents your mailbox. And let's say in this uh, mailbox, uh, this long sequence of mailbox, each mailbox contains one byte. So each mailbox has exactly one byte of information and maybe that is you know one byte which represents let's say the letter A. Uh, we want to look up uh, this uh, letter A somewhere in this so we want to find the location where this A is stored. Um, so it could be a number like the number 8 um, and we look at this mailbox number 114 and inside this mailbox is the number 8. So there's one byte of information in this mailbox. So 114 is a pointer, uh, the pointer which contains the value 8. Uh, if it's storing uh, like an ASCII character A, then it's uh, the pointer is 114 and it's storing uh, this letter A or a number 8 or some other value. Um, so everything that's stored in here, according to C, uh, you need to store this somewhere. And if you use a spreadsheet, you're familiar with this idea. It's just that imagine there's a spreadsheet with only one column. And that's kind of what our address space looks like. So for example, if I wanted to store the value 42, I uh, so n is uh, the the bit width, uh, the byte width of our um, of, uh, of our machine. So if it's a 32-bit machine, then two to the 32 will give you four gigs uh, of memory. So that's what we usually call RAM. It's the memory that we can uh, yeah, use for our programs, and we are going to use this memory by carving out the address of every single location in memory. So it starts from zero, goes all the way to two to the n. Uh, so in a 32-bit machine again, 2 to the n would give you 4 gigs of memory. If you have a 64 gig, 64-bit uh, machine, that's going to be much much larger. Um, so in this machine, the pointer address 4 contains a value 42. So if I want to store something in this position 4, uh, I need to know where this position 4 is and I can copy the value 42 into this location and that's simply copying something into memory so that's easy. Um, so the one caveat is if for example you have an integer so each of these remember is storing one byte and before we saw that an integer on 
uh, my machine at least takes four bytes. So what happens is an integer takes up four spaces of memory here. So the pointer is still four, but when I point to four, I actually end up taking uh, all of this space uh, to store an integer. So it's not just taking this space. All of these, the values might be zero, but uh, I might still have, so if I have a very large number, for example, I might have to store more values here. And when I look at all of these values together, I will get the big number that I have as stored as an integer. So it's important to know that this four is the pointer. And when I ask NF to uh, write something to this pointer, it's going to copy 42 and it can use up to four bytes when it copies a number into this uh, pointer space. So it's um, a very bad idea if you have, for example, a pointer 2 here, and if I want to store an integer at pointer 2, now it might take up all of this space, right? It takes up 4 bytes, and it's overlapping with int i. So if I have an int j and it's in pointer location 2, now I've overwritten what was in i. So the compiler and the operating system uh, have to make sure that doesn't happen. Um, although if you're a hacker, this is the kind of thing you try to exploit. You try to fool the compiler into reading, writing into other people's space and uh, exploit that uh, uh, to break into uh, machines and so on. So um, pointers are uh, just a way of uh, finding the address. So it's just like in the mailbox. Uh, we want to find a place to put a byte we get uh, a location and then for example a function like scanf can take a value uh, that I type in and it saves it into this location um, and when I want to use it I can use the variable uh, to access it so the variable is uh, stored in this location so when I say uh, int i for example uh, int i might be assigned this address when I ask scanf to put something in it, I have to give it the address of i, which is this location. It puts stuff in it. And then when I want to access it, I just uh, use i, because i is the value in this location. So it'll take a, a few tries uh, to get familiar with pointers. Um, it may not just uh, come into your head all at once, but be patient and look at some examples and do the tasks. Uh, so the rest of the tasks uh, don't have any sort of new surprising concepts for you. So uh, once you finish uh, lab one, you'll have a better idea of uh, programming in C uh, and you'll get comfortable. And uh, with pointers, we're going to come back to pointers uh, later on in this course. Um, so remember, Always, uh, when you go to a task, please uh, read the requirements. So read the requirements for task three for if you have finished task one and task two. If you haven't finished those, goes back and solve those. Uh, read the requirements carefully. Uh, and then after each, uh, uh, after you solve each task, remember uh, to uh, git add the file git commit and give a message and then git push it to the GitLab repository and once you do the auto grader will run it and you'll get uh, your results uh, in the results uh, tab of the course website.